Good morning, everyone. I'm Kurt Menke, and I'm going to talk to you about QGIS for hydrological applications, and then I'm going to tie that into QGIS and education. I, I work with Bird's Eye View, which is my own GIS consulting business, and uh, I'm sorry that I had to pre-record this, but I'm right there with you drinking some little coffee on Saturday morning out of my QGIS mug here. Again, my business is Bird's Eye View, and I am uh, at birdseyeviewgis.com. I also have another venture called the Q Cooperative, which is an effort between myself and several of the QGIS developers in Spain and France and uh, Portugal um, to provide QGIS support services, um, especially in North America, where there is kind of a gap in that service these days. So our URL is qcooperative.net. So check it out if you're interested. I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And wherever I go, the TV show Breaking Bad seems to put us on the map. So um, if you're familiar with that, that was shot in my town. And I provide uh, just general services. I do a little bit of everything, mostly spatial analysis and cartography. But increasingly, I find myself uh, being asked to do training. Seems like QGIS training is very um, hot these days. I'm a QGIS certified trainer, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that program at the end of the talk. The reason I can't be with you live is that I have had a really busy year teaching QGIS workshops. And I had a workshop in American Samoa that I thought was going to be scheduled early in 2020 but they really needed to have it done in November. So right now I am down here in American Samoa. Um, well, actually right now I'm, I'm in my office in Albuquerque on Saturday morning recording this, but when you're hearing it, that's where I'll be is in American Samoa teaching a three day QGIS course to some people at the Department of Health in American Samoa. You may know me from some QGIS books. I've written several QGIS books over the last several years. And one of the books is what I want to talk about first this morning is called QGIS for Hydrological Applications. And this was just published in September, so it's a brand new book. I wrote this with Hans van der Kwast, who is a Dutch hydrologist who works at IEG Delft in the Netherlands. And Hans and I have known each other for several years. We met at a QGIS conference in Denmark several years ago, and we were both at the QGIS conference in uh, March in Acaruña, Spain, and this is where we hatched the idea for this book. Hans had developed this, uh, what's in the book, as a curriculum that he teaches at his school, and he has had this as an open curriculum for several years, and he thought it would be nice to publish this as an actual workbook so it could um, be used more widely. So we approached Gary Sherman at Locate Press and floated the idea by him, and he thought it was great. So we worked over this um, mostly over the summer. We got it done in about three months. And now I want to kind of introduce it to you and just kind of show you what's in there. Um, this is a picture from September in the Netherlands where we had our book launch, and we also donated a couple books to the library there. And that week, we also test drove the book with a class at IEG Delft with about 50 students from 20 different countries. And we went through the whole book in a 40-hour week. And um, it worked quite well. So I'm excited to share it with you. This is the blurb on the Locate Press webpage for the book. So the workbook is designed to introduce professionals in the water sector to the state-of-the-art functionality that we have in QGIS 3X these days. But it can also be used as a beginner course for introducing GIS concepts and workflows to people just uh, starting out learning QGIS. For example, the beginning of the book shows a georeferencing workflow where you take a topographic map, georeference it to real-world coordinates, and then learn how to digitize points, lines, and polygons off of that. So you get introduced to digitizing functionality. And at the end of every chapter, we show you how to take the data that you've produced 
and do some nice styling in QGIS to uh, make a nice map. So here, for example, you learn how to label the peaks with a nice SVG icon and use things like label halos around them to help make the labels more readable against the busy background. You learn how to use an inverted or a shape burst fill. It's not inverted, but a shape burst fill to give a nicer style to the lake. So you learn right from the beginning of the book some nice cartographic techniques as well. There's a section on mapping coordinate points, and this involves some meteorological stations in the Netherlands. So first you're shown how to take that data out of a spreadsheet and bring it into QGIS and generate points from the coordinates in that spreadsheet. There's also some temperature data associated with those stations. You're shown how to do a join to attach the temperatures to the points. And finally, there's a discussion on interpolation and you run through a couple different interpolation techniques, IDW, which is inverse distance weighting on the left and nearest neighbor interpolation on the right. And you can then, as a student going through the book, compare the results of those two interpolation techniques and decide which one gives you the better result. The heart of the book is stream and catchment delineation, and the book uses open data throughout. So at the very beginning, you use the SRTM downloader to begin downloading some DEMs. So you download DEM tiles. You mosaic those together. You learn how to reproject those and clip them to your study area. There's a discussion of interpolating voids, but it's not necessary in the example. But you do learn how to fill sinks in that DEM so that you can calculate a nice flow direction map, derive streams, and define the outflow point. The final piece is driving a catchment, which is, is, is British English for a watershed. So you learn how to derive a watershed and then finally convert the final model outputs to data that you can use. For the fill sinks component, that's when water gets trapped in a pit. So on the right, you're seeing a elevation values and there's a lower number in the middle that would trap the water and prevent stream creation. So this gets uh, is, is a common problem with DEMs. And we use the Saga tool, um, fill sinks. There's a, there's a couple of different ones. We use the Wang and Liu fill sink algorithm in the book to create a DEM that can be used for the rest of the analysis. When you're filling sinks, you can do it two different ways. You can, here we have a, you can see a flow down through uh, some elevation pixels here. This would be a sink right here where water would get trapped there. You can either choose to take the average of those pixels and fill that up or cut through to remove that sink. The next step is to derive streams. And we show you two different methodologies, flow accumulation and strailer order. So the strailer order is a, a technique developed by a hydrologist named Strailer. And you start out with two of the smallest tributaries, which would be a strailer order one, where those two order one streams converge, it turns into a strailer order two stream. Where two strailer order two streams converge, that results in a strailer order three. If a lower order hits a higher order, it stays a strailer order three in this, situ in this situation where the one meets a three, but then where the two threes converge, it results in a strailer order four. So that's the idea behind strailer orders and the resulting output also gives you um, nice data that you can use to style streams in a more intuitive way that taper to tips in, in at the lower strailer orders. So in QGIS, this is what the output of that strailer order algorithm looks like. Um, here, the palleted unique values renderer is being used and a blue color ramp, and you're seeing the strailer orders from um, 10 to 1. And one of the things you have to do when you're doing this kind of hydrological analysis is do some sensitivity training. So you need to here deduce which of the strailer orders represents 
real streams in the real world. So in other words, what's the threshold below which they aren't actually streams in the real world? And so we show how we can use um, the Quick Map Services plugin and, and the OpenStreetMap base map to look where streams are on the landscape and see which trailer orders are lining up with those to um, set a threshold that will be used in other algorithms um, going forward. Uh, the next tool that we show you how to use is another Saga tool, Channels, Network, and Drainage Basins. And this tool can be used with the D8 method, where you're using eight surrounding pixels to determine flow direction. There's also a, a, a D infinite method. Uh, usually you get better results with D8. It's more reliable, so that's what um, gets covered more thoroughly in the book. There's also a section on doing spatial analysis with map algebra. So in this scenario, the scenario you're given, you're looking to identify suitable wells and you're given information that the well should be within 150 meters of houses or roads, have no industry mines or landfills within 300 meters, and a depth parameter. The well should be less than 40 meters deep. So you're given some input data for each of these parameters. And you go through a workflow to uh, identify the wells that meet all those criteria using the raster calculator. And then at the end, again, you're shown how to nicely style the output so that you have a, a nice intuitive result to show people. Another example of some of the cartography in the book is uh, developing circular color ramps for flow direction rasters. So a flow direction raster is very similar in a lot of ways to aspect, where it's telling you which direction streams are flowing down a slope. And in that case, two, you know, uh, 360 and 1 are both north. So you really need to develop a color ramp that's circular, where um, north at both ends is the same color. And so here we show you how to use the color ramp editor to develop one of those circular color ramps so that you can intuitively style the output. So this is really stressed throughout the book, and this is actually the reason I'm talking about this more, because that's the part of the book I worked on the most. This is the final map that gets produced in the book, and we show you lots of nice tricks for creating nice cartographic maps in the print composer. So this one, for example, has a locator map that you use map themes to produce. The study area is being accented with an inverse polygon shape burst spill. You learn how to use expressions to create an automatic date that gets updated whenever you open the project and use a variable for your name as cartographer. You learn how to use blending mode. So all the towns on this map were pulled from OpenStreetMap and there, we're using a nice technique with label halos in here and blending modes, which help um, the halo be effective without getting too much visual emphasis on the map. And the elevation is being depicted on the map with a gradient legend. So now I want to switch gears. I was asked by the organizing committee to talk briefly about a series of blogs that I've just published this fall uh, called Esri and Me. It's a four-part series where I go through my origin story with Phos4G how my relationship with Esri has affected my community, conservation. I do a lot of work in ecological conservation and have for quite a while. So um, there's a story there. And, uh, and finally, education to wrap this all up. And this whole blog series was really inspired by this tweet that I um, did a few years ago um, at this Society for Conservation GIS conference which was a, an open conference, but hosted or largely sponsored by Esri. So I just, it was funny because there was, all the posters were made by and printed by Esri, but I was teaching an intro to QGIS class. So the irony was obvious and I tweeted this out and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go forward. So my Phos4G origin story. Um, so I began, I've been doing GS for a long time, back in, a, since the late nineties. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of open source GIS available. So, so I learned on Unix workstations using ArcInfo 7 and eventually ArcView 3X, you know, writing Avenue scripts and AML scripts to get things done. And in 
2001, I was working a lot with um, web mapping applications, and I was um, using ArcIMS and Map Objects IMS and having all kinds of problems with those and discovered Map Server and, and a really early version of PostGIS. It was a, an early version of Map Server as well. And when I, these were really time consuming at the time to get installed. But once I got these installed on the server and configured, rebuilt the map applications with them, they were faster, more stable. I mean, they were so stable that you wouldn't even have to check on them for a year at a time. They were just, they just ran and ran and ran. And I was sold on open source at that point. And that took me to the first map server user meeting in 2003. So this is the, the picture of that meeting, which is really a precursor of all the FOS4Gs that we have now. So there were about 100, 125 people there. And there's a, a much younger version of me pictured in the back there. And uh, it, it was an exciting time to get involved because it was it felt very new and subversive to me, the open source technology. A few years later, I had my first encounter with QGIS. In 2004, I downloaded QGIS, which was at version 0 0.7 CMIS. And if you haven't seen it, this is what CMIS looked like or what QGIS looked like at that time. And uh, so it's come a long way since then. It's amazing what QGIS has evolved into. Another thing that came up when I was putting this blog together was uh, a story about a conference coup that Esri orchestrated in my community a few years back. There used to be this organization called the Southwest User Group, and it was a grassroots conference that would travel amongst five southwestern U.S. states. It would go from New Mexico to Colorado to Wyoming to Utah to Arizona and back again. And each time it would go to one of these states, it was held by the local community on a volunteer basis. And the conference was started in New Mexico, where I live, and had a clear mandate to be an open conference, even though we realized that 90% of the people would be using Esri software. And this is one of the, the programs that um, we put together when I was uh, co-chair of this conference in 2007, where we had a, it was on Halloween, so we had a nice Halloween-styled logo for the conference, and it was in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And five years later, it came back around to us in 2012, and Esri had started trying to insert themselves into this SWUG organization, which again, was all volunteer. And in 2012, um, they asked if they could be a, have a seat on our organizing committee, and we told them that vendors were not allowed, but they could sponsor if they would like to. They declined and instead organized a competing conference for the same week an hour away, just up the road. Our meeting was going to be in Albuquerque, and theirs was going to be in Santa Fe, and they're two neighboring towns. And so... They, and to make a long story short, they killed our conference. Their conference pulled enough attendance away from us that we couldn't pass enough seed money on to the next state to organize the next one. They set up a domain and were really aggressive about it and completely took over the conference, made it um, an Esri Swug, rebranded it Esri Swug, and um, it now pretty much no longer exists. And, and this had been a conference that had been operating as an open conference for 25 years. It was a really painful experience. And um, so for me, the message is that we really have to be diligent in our communities to keep things open um, and inclusive of everyone. And uh, this was a cautionary tale for me. Another blog entry involved conservation. So I mentioned I do a lot of ecological conservation work. And I've been part of this organization called the Society for Conservation GIS for a long time. And um, this is an organization that's independent. They're a nonprofit, but they are heavily sponsored by Esri. And when I tweeted that picture of uh, a few slides back of, of me teaching a QGIS class with an Esri poster, one of the Esri sponsors who was getting ready to sign the memorandum of understanding to provide support to SCGIS for another five years, balked at that and said, why are we supporting this organization? And I had to talk everyone down and Fortunately, the MOU got signed. Boards started inviting me to teach more QGIS workshops. And so the last three years, I've gone there to teach QGIS workshops. And it's a heavy, heavily Esri-influenced organization. 
In fact, conservation in the U.S. in general is ESRI oriented because all the nonprofits are given free or close to free licenses by ESRI. So to go there teaching QGIS is um, me walking into a bunch of ESRI users trying to share this technology with them. And the people in my workshops really appreciate it. The workshops always go really well and people are excited about it. But walking around the conference, I get a lot of nasty looks and rude comments. And I started feeling this last year, you know, really uncomfortable. I started getting, you know, heckled and things like that in talks I was given. And um, so, again, it always amazes me. I don't know what the take home point is here, but it takes a champion to really convert a community or an organization to start using FOSS 4G in some way. And um, I've always experienced that as soon as um, I've left organizations, they've reverted back to Esri after I've left many times. So it really, um, it takes a lot of hard work for some reason in the United States to keep organizations using open source. And this takes me to education. In the US, Almost all of the colleges and universities are teaching GIS via Esri without any other software. And I see this as an ethical issue because if students want to do what I do and be a consultant or continue their studies after they graduate, once they lose their geography department Esri license, they're out of luck and they don't know of any alternatives. And so I really, one of my real... Um, focus areas is trying to get universities to offer more than Esri, teach some classes with QGIS or PostGIS or R or GRASS. Um, and I think this is one of the keys to really getting broader FOSS4D adoption in the world is, is getting students aware of it as they're going through school. And I mean, I think it's fine to teach Esri as well, but I think, you know, people should be teaching more than one tool to, to do this kind of work. So, my contribution to this so far has been writing books. And this book I came out with this spring to me is really a resource that educators can use. It could be used for um, independent study by people as well. But this is a 400 page workbook that has 32 lab exercises in it. And so my idea is that professors can use this because I know professors don't have a lot of time to learn QGIS or develop a new curriculum. So I wrote this so that they could use it all or in part to start weaving QGIS into their curriculums in geography departments and other departments teaching GIS. And this is another book published through Locate Press. So again, my idea is kind of like if I build it, they will come. And I had this idea this spring when it got published to get these postcards printed out and to mail them to professors. And so I spent weeks looking up the two top universities teaching geography or geospatial in all 50 U.S. states, and I would send all the professors in that department one of these postcards. So I sent out 400 different cards this spring, and I advertised this on Twitter and got several international folks interested, and I sent postcards to about a dozen other countries. So if you know any professors who could um, benefit by um, using this book to start teaching QGIS in their curriculum, let me know and I'll be happy to send them a card. Since this isn't an interactive presentation, um, the conference organizers asked me to talk a little bit about what I thought FOSS4G was, was um, what the status was in Latin America and in the U.S. Um, in the U.S., we have a QGIS user group, for example, and we have an OSGEO um, chapter as well, but there's very little participation. Most of the, like in the QGIS group, there's about four or five of us who are active. In OSGEO, again, it's six or eight people in the U.S. chapter who are active. But I know that there are, you know, thousands of users out there, but they're um, kind of hidden. And um, when I look at Latin America and the QGIS user groups, it looks like things are going fairly well down there. You, there are, there's national user groups in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, Peru. So I think that's fantastic. When you when you have a national user group, you also get a vote in QGIS elections. So that's a, that's a nice um, perk as well. And another thing I was asked was what I thought, um, if I had any suggestions for 
um, QGIS Mexico. And um, one thing I wanted to talk about uh, from that standpoint is QGIS certification. So this is a program that's only been around for a year and a half or so. And uh, what it is, is if, if you are a QGIS certified organization, when you teach a course, you can give your students an official QGIS certificate. And this can be used for professional workshops to full semester courses and anything in between. And the program itself has two main goals. One is to get more community involvement in the QGIS project. So when you apply to this program to one of the ways um, you get um, approved as a QGIS certifying organization is to document all your contributions to the QGIS project. So only people who have contributed to the project in some way can get approved. The other is to vet your educational materials. So we um, ask for a sample of lessons and data and lectures to make sure that QGIS as a project is being represented accurately and that things are up to date. It's also a nice revenue stream for the QGIS project. Every certificate that gets issued results in a 20 euro donation to QGIS.org. And so for myself as a consultant, when I teach a professional workshop, I wrap this 20 euro cost into my consulting fee. And um, it's a little harder for me to get the local universities I teach with to offer these, but I do have my local continuing education department now um, allowing me to offer QGIS certificates as well. So I think it would be great if more um, universities and um, people who are teaching QGIS workshops in Latin America would apply to be QGIS certified organizations. So if you're interested in that, this is the URL that you can use to sign up. You simply fill in your name, your email, your web address, and, and uh, you will be contacted um, by one of us who are previewing um, these applications. And you'll be asked to provide um, a sample of your teaching material and also all your contributions to the project. Another thing that is asked for is basically to get your, make sure you have good standing in your local QGIS community. And the, the QGIS Project Steering Committee makes the final determination on whether you are a QGIS certified organization or not. So how's it going? Well, there are um, currently, I think it's actually a little larger. I think it's two dozen certifying organizations in the world at the moment. In 2018, there were 214 certificates issued, which resulted in over 4,000 euros in revenue for the QGIS project. In 2019, there have been 100, actually this is dated. This is a from a slide I gave in March. I actually haven't gotten updated data. I'm fairly certain that in 2019, the revenue is over 5,000 euros at this point. So the program is going pretty well. And um, I think this would be a great way for um, people teaching QGIS in Latin America to get more involved with the project and provide a revenue stream and also provide your students with official QGIS certificates. That can be a nice perk for them. So that's the end of my talk. I really would love to thank the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to um, talk to you. It's a real honor to be invited. I wish I could have um, given a live talk, but if you have questions for me, this is my contact information. Feel free to um, email me or ping me on Twitter and, and ask me about anything that I've gone over. And I hope you have a great conference. Thank you.